Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Door to Door. It's our nonfiction issue. Oh, hi, I'm Virginia. Hey, everyone. This is Chris here. Good to see you. And Lainey. Hi. So we, um, first of all, thank you for joining us. Uh, we did um, a presentation of titles that was our third world famous presentation um, and um, it's famous throughout the world in our minds. And um, it was a lot of fun, it was two hours. And we asked people what they were, um, you know, what are they loving? What do they need to hear more of? And people resoundingly said, we'd love to hear some more nonfiction. So we thought, okay, hey, let's put on a show of nonfiction titles. And here we are on this snowy Thursday talking nonfiction, the truth and nothing but the truth. So help us. So here we go. So Lainey, what did you do? You put together a catalog, yeah? Do tell. Yes. So tell that the is at home. <laughs> that's available. And I'm going to right now put it in the chat for you. So catalog, and you have it ready. We're trying to go over a lot of them, but you know, we won't get to everything. We have lots of good things and you can just check them out at your leisure. Um, but as we go, I'll share the, the jackets with you being follow along with us. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's dive in, shall we? Who wants to go first? We're just throwing everything out there. Like Lainey says, when we get to, we get to, and I don't know, let's just see. You guys want to start? Sure. I'm happy to head us off. I'm really hungry. So I'm going to talk about a cookbook. I don't know if that's a bad idea or a good idea. <laughs> it sounds delicious though. Um, so I'll be talking about Everyone's Table by Gregory Gorday. Lainey is kind enough to share the jacket. There's Gregory, uh, who is an acclaimed award-winning chef who was born in Brooklyn, raised in Queens, and then in 2008 uh, moved to Portland, Oregon. And this is a case where Gregory was already incredibly successful and again acclaimed, but he wasn't living a healthy life. He had dealt with addiction and the sickness and pain that goes along with that. And he kind of reset his life when he moved to Portland and really concentrated on being like health focused, clean foods that are still you know, delicious, that are globally inspired. And so he took all his training and all his desires for a healthy life and really focused it into his work. And that's what this book, Everyone's Table is offering. So they're globally inspired dishes that don't have gluten, dairy, soy, legumes, or grains, which you would think like, how can you possibly make a delicious meal without those? Well, let Gregory help you because you can. These are all extremely delicious, healthy, that use superfoods, you know, foods that are dense with nutrients and healthy fats, and just like the most bang for your buck. So you feel full, you feel satisfied. And it's sustainable because I think that's really the trick with healthy eating. Healthy is often synonymous with flavorless, not particularly desirable, desirable. It's just like something you have to force yourself to do. Not the case here. So there are amazing, again, recipes, photos, uh, and also kind of, you know, infused with Gregory's own amazing story and personality. He was a top chef star. Um, he was the runner up for season 12. Men's Health named him one of the fittest chefs in America. Um, yeah, and he's just bursting with personality art, as are these recipes. So I'm very excited about this. I'm always adding to my cookbook collection. Uh, so this will be a valuable asset once it pubs in May. It's not that far away. Uh, so May 11th, it goes on sale. Christopher. Um, yeah. Are you still making bread? I haven't made bread in a while. And don't let, I mean, because Gregory inspired me to not make bread. No, actually, just because it's messy. Anytime you, I've realized you like make bread, it's so, I don't know if there's like a clean way to make bread, but like me, there's flour on the walls to, to, you know, two rooms down. I don't know how it happens, but like the entire apartment is just covered in flour. A um, clean way is just to go right to that grocery store, to the bread aisle. You don't have yes. to worry about <laughs> Now I just use, yeah. Now I just use lettuce. I wrap everything in lettuce. That's mm. not true, but maybe someday, maybe with Gregory's help. That's not what he's doing. He's not just like wrapping stuff in lettuce. His <laughs> recipes are far more beautiful and delicious. Um, but we do have some great uh, 
bread baking books and I know our friend uh, Nora with early word she's a big bed bread baker so oh, yeah I, I'm thinking of bread now Delicious. I know although this this book is is really gonna people are all talking about this book yeah I, I, if you if you're unfamiliar with him or you just want a refresher there's a lot of great videos and interviews with him yeah he's just a very intriguing you know um, just, just poignant person with what he says and what he does so always uh, love a new take on fine cuisine so mm -hmm. yum what else there you go there we go are people watching that's a great question let me check are you watching we do have people yeah. watching we have Lots uh of yeah we and our friend maxine is here and she says try bread toast crumbs cookbook no mess no kneading that's exactly uh -huh. what i needed maxine <laughs> thank you uh donna wilder is here janet lockhart janet uh, donna Davis, Vicky right. Rock. Okay. Yes. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Yeah, this is, we're so happy to join us. <laughs> it's a snowy, cozy day that we're talking. So I love that you kicked it off with that book, Chris. Yes. Um, Lainey, do you want to talk about a book? What do you sure. Have? Let's. I want to talk about something that's bringing me a lot of joy lately. Gonna get, get to it though. Um. So I want to talk about Leslie Jordan and how y'all doing? So. Many people know, well, if you're like me, you know Leslie Jordan from Will and Grace, um, the original series. Uh, he He's hilarious in that show. And so I had always known him from that. But then recently he has gone viral with these Instagram videos that he's been doing, which in the book he says, someone told me I went viral. I was just talking to my camera and now I thought it was something to do with the virus. And now I was like, I, no, I'm good. I'm safe. And they're like, no, you went viral online. <laughs> so he uh, has just kind of blown up recently, even though he's been on the scene making movies and TV shows for so long. But just uh, I think he's picking up a, a wider audience and people are loving him on Instagram. So this is his. And so he went famous with a video that said, how y'all doing? So this is his uh, his collection of, of essays about his life and it's very sweet and fun. I, th I think it's like, it's just cotton candy. It's just so fun and sweet and gone way too soon. I wanted it to keep going even after it ended. Um, and he talks about growing up in Tennessee and growing up gay in Tennessee and what that was like. He talks about his parents and his family and, and how they went through a lot in his life. Um, and how he dealt with a lot of a lot of things coming into Hollywood, uh, leaving his home and going into Hollywood. And um, just I was cracking up, wanting to read everyone's bits of it as I was reading. Like, you have to hear this. It's so funny. Um, and he has a whole chapter about how he loves Mississippi. He was in the help. Um, and so he spent a lot of time in uh, areas of Mississippi and talked about writers he loved, he talked about the bookmobile, which was great growing up with the bookmobile. Um, it's just, it's a delightful read. And I want to show you his book announcement on Instagram because it will crack you up. And this is, you'll get a feel for exactly who he is. So here's his, and he has a new show um I think it's life with cat it's got Mayim Bialik and he's he steals the show every scene he's so funny so this is his announcement of the book well hi y'all how you doing it's Leslie Jordan I'm reading a book called the grapes of wrath I wrote it actually <laughs> many years ago I'm very proud to <laughs> I didn't write the grapes of wrath <laughs> Y'all will fall for anything. Let's see what I did right there. <laughs> How y'all doing? Harper Collins. It's coming out April the 27th, but you can pre order it, but you have to go to the link in my bio. I don't know what that means, but maybe you do. The link in my bio. <laughs> 
so that gives you a taste of you know how he is if you don't know him already i mean you should but if you don't that's how he is and go check out his videos because he's been doing like collaborations with dolly pardon and fun people singing hymns and he's just a riot and he talks a lot about you know acting and that process and i think he was very truthful with that and like open about how he gets in shows and what his process is like and um maybe how it's not what you think it it's a really fun essay book and i, I hope you um check him out and go to instagram and, and see what he posts it will keep you laughing and he was on um on new year's eve with uh anderson cooper right oh my god and um wait what's his name a uh, cohen andy cohen yeah. Oh my God, it, it was hilarious. He was talking about the mirror. He bought that mirror work out by looking in the mirror. It, it, he's just very funny. He's just he's so self-effacing and he's just, he just seems so approachable. So anyway, that's super fun. Super, super fun. Um, yeah, man, we're looking at, I'm looking at the quotes here. Barbara Jenko's here. Everyone's here. Donna's here. She wants to know, I want to know how Chris is making bread that, that he finds it on his walls two years later. I want to come to that bread baking party. Chris, you've got bread on your walls. Yes, I'd like to go to that party too. Um, Janet Lockhart says, love how y'all doing, funny and heart and touching. As an Instagram follower, I can hear his voice as I read. Um, oh, I know, right? When Lainey, when you were talking about it, you I, I immediately thought that you must have listen to the audio book because you were just almost, I don't know, you were channeling him in a weird way. It was fun. I read it in his voice, so. Yeah. Is he doing events? Is Leslie doing events connected with the book? Chris, do you know? I will look into it. I see the comments. I am Rocco not sure. Also. Yeah, I, Rocco, I will reach out. We will find out. Door to door, we would love that too, Chandler. Oh, yes. people. Send all the mojo, we're trying, you know? It's a tough one, celebrities. Oh, and Maxine love. said Chattanooga. Yeah, he's from Chattanooga in Tennessee. Yeah. Um, so he did something with their public library, she said. He has a book before this, so. Yeah, we'd love to have him on, but we'll have to see. We will have to see, we hope it happens. Let's so. see, we have a viewer. Michael, who's in frozen Texas, Houston. I hope everyone there is doing okay. I know it's really tough and so sorry. Yeah, and my thoughts your way. It's unbelievable what's happening in Texas. Um, okay, more books. Shall I? I don't know what to talk about first. Maybe we'll talk about Life on the Line, which is a bit of a switch but what wouldn't be a bit of a switch from our previous book uh life on the line this is um so this so this uh the author emma goldberg had written this um article in the times if you go to edelweiss you can read that uh piece and this is uh this book came out of that piece um and that was written back in march <clears throat> excuse me um, when um, medical, stu medical students were graduating and the schools were letting them out a bit early so that they could get on, um, help out because manpower was quickly being consumed by the virus. Now, again, this article, which I'm just pulling up, was dated March 26th, 2020. Uh, and she wrote this in the Times, um, early graduation could send medical students to virus front lines. Hundreds of fourth year students at universities in Boston and New York could start caring for patients months ahead of schedule. And they did. Um, and this is, this is, so you can go back and read that because that's right there. And then this book is called Life on the Line. And it's uh, young doctors come of age in a pandemic and they just hit the, literally hit the ground running. Um, and this is focused on New York City medical students um, whose residencies took them right to the center of the COVID crisis. So um, it's a, she, in the article, she talks about these young doctors and offers this in-depth portrait of um, how the pandemic sort of redefined their roles, you know, and, um, and what it meant to be doctors, um, but to be 
coworkers, to be classmates, to be friends, romantic partners. I mean, their whole lives were turned upside down. And so she really um, immersed herself um, into these stories and these in-depth interviews with all of these people, videos, doctor's diary entries. I mean, here in New York and around the world, I'm assuming, I mean, we were ringing the bells at seven o'clock every night. It was like this, you know, we were all sort of connected and supportive of what they were doing. It was, it was and still remains unbelievable. But anyway, this is focusing on these, these uh, graduates are graduating a bit early to get out there and, um, and put their lives on the line. And so that's uh, the story of, um, that's the story of this book by Emma Goldberg. This goes on sale June 8th. And um, in the tradition of Sherry Fink's Five Days at Memorial and Scotch Rose One L. So there you go. But je definitely check out the the piece on Edelweiss. Just it was just the beginning. Okay. You know, oh, someone said asked us at the Buzz where they could find these links. So if I can just show them, if you go on Edelweiss and find the jacket, it says links right under. And yeah. Just click that and it's slow right now, but usually the link yeah. comes on the right. So yeah, yeah. Just, uh, there, there it is. you go. So in case anybody needs to know that. Yeah. Thank you, Lainey. All right. Let's see. What else? What else do we have? Oh, da, da. Okay, if we want to keep going around, um, I love a good father-son exploration. So I'm going to talk about Pops by Craig Melvin, who is the beloved news anchor and co-host of Today. Just a very warm, um, endearing person uh, who, again, many people are huge fans of. This is an exploration of Craig's own complicated relationship with his father uh, and all the kind of I don't want to say stand-ins, but the, the the father figures that came into his life in lieu of like a healthy relationship with his dad when he was growing up in South Carolina. Um, so the inspiration for this book came, many of you might know that there was a series running, Dad's Got This, on the, on the Today Show that Craig had hosted for about a year and a half, which is a story of fathers doing amazing things under really hard or strange circumstances and just their accomplishments and coming through. So he took that and he's now again inspecting his own relationship with his dad who, you know, he battled alcoholism. He wasn't always around. He worked the late shift um, at a postal facility. So, you know, he had this really complicated relationship and especially after inspecting all these other, you know, father figures, he wanted to kind of get down to the bottom of it. So this is part memoir, part investigation into his relationship with his father, what it means to be a father um, and the surrogate father figures in his life. So uncles and teachers and uh, mentors who helped him become the amazing person he is today. So um, it is again, part reconciliation with his dad, you know, looking back with the benefit of time and experience to have a more kind of balanced look at his father, what it means to be a dad, and what you can do to heal. So um, this is a big book for us. Again, he'll be all over because he is part of the NBC's Today Show, and it's publishing in June. So yeah, this is going to be a very fun, um, exciting publication for us. Uh, so that's Pops by Craig Melvin. Nice. So we want to follow the theme of dad. So we have a book called Dad, How Do I? And oh, there's the jacket. So this is by Rob Kinney. And he went, you know, he has this huge following on YouTube. He started this Dad, How Do I YouTube channel. Um, he grew up the one of uh, eight kids and his dad um, wasn't there. And so he kind of had to learn a lot of things on his own. And he wished someone was there to teach him. And so he created this channel. He has two kids that are in their 20s and he wanted to make this channel. You know, he's answering all these questions and figuring things out for himself. So he's like, well, everybody else might want to know this. So he created this channel called Dad, How Do I? And I've watched a few of them, you know, like he had one about like 
caulking a gun, like a caulk gun and like how to put that in there and how to fix stuff in your bathroom. And, you know, it, it's a well of information and he does it in such a simple way for people to understand. Um, he has like 2.5 million subscribers. It's, it's huge. And so he wanted to write a book based on everything he's talked about. And I, I'll put a link to it. There's a great book announcement. You can hear from him himself on his YouTube channel. And he talks about how excited he was to work on the book because he had seen a lot of people asking for one. So he said, okay, well now the cat's out of the bag. I can tell you that I have a book coming. Um, and he talks about how it's in two parts. So one of one part is he went around and for his um, recent birthday, he told each of his siblings something that like a, a characteristic or a trait that they taught him and he thinks uh, is great for them. And like, not great for them, he, that is wonderful about them and that they taught him to be a better person. So he puts all of those in here and, and lessons you can learn, but then part of it is uh, 50 practical tips and what you can do um and so we're oh and of course there's a bad uh, not a bad a good dad joke we love good slash bad dad jokes um in the video and i won't spoil it you can go listen to it yourself because it did crack me up so <laughs> that's dad how do i i'll share that video and it is coming in may hello that sounds good because I have no idea how to caulk anything. I mean, I can caulk stuff, but like, how do you get that caulk into that gun? Like that kind of stuff? I always Someone... loved the caulking guns when I was growing up. My Wait, dad's what? hardware yeah. store, I'd like do, I'd carry two around. Like in my dad's hardware store, he always sold <laughs> caulking guns. And I was never allowed to have like fake guns or anything like that growing up. So I would mm. like replace them with things like that like talking guns and did you have a holster for them i probably uh, no not no, no that would have been very cool but i didn't i just like yeah carry the talking guns around i think this is a good time for you to share your um forklifting story you're just like the idea that you forklifted it all. oh yeah, I, I'm fascinating. yeah I've, I've i've driven a forklift many many a time and i in the storeroom and everything of the hardware store and uh Lifted the pallets up 20 feet high. That's so cool. Yeah, never sent. Oh, God. Sorry, there's something happening outside. <laughs> Maybe it's a forklift. <laughs> it's something. It's a, I think it's a snow plow slash salter, oh. and it's just very loud. So, yeah, I me. put the video in there. I think it's someone who is always calling my dad, and I'm like, is this a thing? Like, how does someone do this? That this is perfect because you can just mm -hmm. kind of look it up without having to really ask yeah. anyone every time well so chris and laney and i haven't been to a um you know a conference in forever naturally nobody has but when we would be at a conference days before the show would open up we would be hauling boxes of galleys all over the place and taking tons of advil at the end of the night but there would be these people then we'd be like oh that pallet is all the way down at the other end of the convention center we got to go and get it and so we'd have to go bug somebody with a forklift to go get it. And it was just, I always found it so fascinating. I said, if I, if I ever find myself not in this fabulous position working for Collins, I want to be, a, I, want to, I want to operate a forklift. So when Chris told me he operated a forklift, I was like, oh, you're so lucky. Okay. I was never as good as those conference people. They, they drive with reckless abandon. I'm sure it's earned through hours of experience, but they whiz around those yeah narrow and it gets to those tightest spots like they're gonna knock that entire display over and it's just like eee! no they don't so cool yeah and i um, see john janet lockhart says her brother operates a forklift for the postal service and she'd oh, love to drive one someday so janet wants to drive one she does janet yeah. let's go to forklift school together it would be so much fun <laughs> now that lady forklift the one who was running the forklift and she gave me this whole information about this whole group of women who support each other and they do all these um you know give me a whole facebook page about it and i was like oh my god i'm totally joining this mm -hmm. it didn't happen okay anyway wait not, yet. not yet one day one yeah. day mm. 
Laney, you know what that means. Next book is, is, Horse Girls, Recovering, Aspiring, and Devoted Writers, Redefine the Iconic Bond. Now, uh, I don't believe we've yet spoken about this book. Um, and this is by, I believe I'm saying her name right. And if I'm not, I apologize for that because I could not uh, find the pronunciation for it. Halima, H-A-L-I-M-A-H, Marcus. Um, and this is, she uh, is the executive director of um, Electric Literature's um, online um, uh, publication and um, they edit um, essay collections. This is um, taking on the stereotype of the horse girl. And we have been talking about this because probably some of you out there know what we're talking about. But these girls who just so identify with horses were often sometimes the sort of butt of other kids' um, jokes uh, at their expense. Um, and so it, it, this is sort of just kind of turning this on its head, turning the, um, the horseshoe upside down, if you will. I just made that up. Um, but it explodes the meme of these affluent white girls oblivious to their mockery. I mean, we, you know, I had a, a friend who lived across the street from me. She was totally a horse girl. She was completely locked into that world, you know, and a language that they understood the horses, the horses, and some of them didn't have horses. That was just their connection. Um, but this is, um, this is a collection of, um, of essays written by uh, people who could identify or could would uh, sort of break open the stereotype. And the author, once again, you show, if you want to show, there's an author's note on Edelweiss that talks about um, her eating disorder as a, as a young girl um, and how sh her connection uh, with uh, horses as a young child um, is sort of, that's where she, you know, she, they understood her and she understood them. And then she sort of felt like, well, um, if I'm not going to, you know, ride horses professionally, then what am I doing? And she went away to college. And um, that was, as she says, that was sort of the simple explanation. Uh, the more complicated reason had to do with limitations riding placed on what her world might look like and who I was allowed to be in it. Um, she talks about when she was sat down to write a memoir piece, um, which she had called uh, who, who Loves It Most. It was her first um, entrance into writing about horses. Uh, which in the past she'd really kind of steered clear of. Um, she thought it was going to be sort of this straightforward, you know, sort of you know, why she loved them. And then, um, but she kind of, um, there were a lot of other threads that she felt had to be um, addressed in this piece and how her love of horses helped her to overcome her teenage eating disorder. Um, she talks, talked in this piece about her religious upbringing in an Islamic community, her relationship with her parents, her friendships. Um, and so this book is, um, you know, a collection of essays about other women who um, have written to sort of you know, address their um, connections. And um, this is it. This is Horse Girls, redefining the iconic bond. Um, what else can I tell you? I don't know. I just think that it's, um, it's important. And I think we all know somebody who we can give this to. So there, horse girls. Okay. Oh wait, I wanna read this quote. Can you put the jacket back up for one second, please? This is from Emma Coakley Eisenberg. She says, more than a fun romp through gorgeous prose by some of our finest contemporary writers. Horse girls is a sublime exploration of the way Horses bring together the physical and the spiritual, the masculine and the feminine. Funny, earnest, sexy, and unexpected. Um, I should tell you about some of the essays that are written by uh, who the contributors are. Um, uh, Carmen Maria Machado, uh, Adrian Kelt, uh, C. Morgan Baps, Sarah Enlow Snyder. Um, a diverse range of voices and experiences represented in the collection challenges the stereotypes of horse girls 
as primarily rich and white and thin. So there you go. Okay, fresh girls. Next. Uh, I think I'll talk about The Quiet Zone by Stephen Kersey. You have that handy, Laney. This is a little bit away. It's coming in August, but I just think it sounds like such a fantastic read. So I'm really excited about it. Um, so this is a nonfiction exploration of this small town, uh, Green Bank, West Virginia, which is home to the Green Bank Observatory. So um, in as a result of that, the town, there's no Wi-Fi or internet access, radio frequencies, all of that is banned to avoid any interference with the observatory. So that in and of itself is very interesting. And Stephen is taking a deep dive. He know he really kind of um, injected himself into this small community. And there's all kinds of folks living here. Uh, apparently there's some neo-Nazis who are hiding out in the woods. There's, you know, just regular folk who just enjoy the peace and quiet and the lack of, you know, over connectivity that goes along with that. It's just, a, it runs the gamut of people living here, but I think there are just so many threads. Um, I mean, one thing that they talk about is like the town of Stranger Things or Twin Peaks. Like it has that really moody atmospheric element to the book and to this town. Uh, he talks about the sheriff's department where there are a string of unsolved murders that took place. Um, and again, all of this is kind of in this bubble of, you know, no internet, which is just so fascinating. So it's not just a murder mystery story. It really is just a very deep dive look at this town, what it means to live unconnected when that's our, you know, that permeates every element of our lives otherwise. Um, and how you can live, how you can be happy or unhappy, and the complications that go along with having no act, no connectivity. So I think it's really, really cool. Um, and Stephen has a has a history of really diving deep into these subjects, and uh, he's an award-winning journalist. He's worked for the Times, the New Yorker, the Economist, amongst many others. So he's the perfect person for this. And also, I found this note very interesting. He's lived without a cell phone for over a decade, so he is perhaps the perfect person to tell this story of this town and its people. Uh, and yeah, I just think it's very, very cool. So this is again coming August 3rd. Um, that's The Quiet Zone, Stephen Percy. So do check it out. So we have our true crime fans here. I know Casey's here, I know you're a true crime fan. Um, Confident Women by Tori Telfer. I love Tori Telfer so much. If you haven't read her book before this, Lady Killers, and you like true crime, you have to read it. I listened to the audio book a while back when it came out and it is, I, I quote, I think about it all the time and I have so many fun facts about, uh, fun, quote unquote, fun facts about <laughs> female murderers. But um, it's so cool. And so this is her next book, confident women and it's all about con women so I think Tori is one of she's my one of my favorite true crime writers that we have because she takes these really big concepts and these really big stories larger than life women um, throughout history and she puts it into a this immensely readable format that you just keep turning pages and you have to know what happens but putting it also in a framework of understanding so it's not just the crime itself but putting you in in their shoes and understanding why they are doing this so incompetent women um it, it's throughout history women who you know why are we so obsessed with cons and and kind of getting one over on people um especially when it comes to women maybe who were put into a world that was not built for them and this might have been one of their only chances to get out of their world and so she puts that in this book and it is so interesting. It goes all throughout time. There's 1700s Paris where a woman um, scammed royal jewelers out of this larger than large necklace that was made for Marie Antoinette and she kind of blamed Marie Antoinette and that might have gone into some of the reasons that the, the royal family wasn't trusted. Um, I'll let you decide once you read that story. 
Um, we have like mid 1800s when we talk about um, sisters who started this religious revival movement um, saying they could speak to spirits and they conned a lot of people with that um, and go in the 1900s with women embezzling money. It's fascinating, but you also, in some way, you're kind of rooting for them because they're, they have a lot of really dark history and a past where they're trying to escape from things. I'm not saying any of it's right, but she puts it in, in terms where you think you kind of want them to get away with it in some ways. And, um, and she explores why you want them to get away with it. Um, and so, but at the beginning of each section, because it's broken down in sections, she has a list of the women she's going to cover, but she also has a list of everything that you will read throughout the chapter, which I think is really funny. Not only the list sounds funny, but it's cool because at the end you're like, oh, I remember that from the list. I know I'm at the end of this section. So I just wanted to read a couple of um, things for her list. So in her section called the Glitterati, she lists the women in the first section and it says miscellaneous or miscellanea and it's a list. It says one hot air balloon, one hot air balloon inspired product, eight grand pianos, 647 plus diamonds, one fake queen, two fake fathers, one real fainting spell, numerous fake fainting spells, one soldier who loves calligraphy, one elderly man driven to his deathbed in shock and it just goes on and on. Um, and things you're like, how does that connect? I can't see how that would connect. And she does it so well. Um, anyway, I'll stop talking about it because I could talk all day and I find it very fascinating. But you can hear from Tori herself because she's taking over our Instagram tomorrow and has some fun things planned for us. And we listened to what you said during our event and we're only going to do three hours to see if you guys can kind of find more, you know, put some time into looking at it. So Tori Telfer tomorrow, 11 to one Eastern. She's gonna have some some fun things about confident women for you. And go listen to Lady Killers or read it if you have a chance. So confident women coming out in February. And there's a library hardcover edition as well. You have been all over this. That is so cool. Lainey. Very fun. Yeah. Um, I think I would like to talk about, well, what's the difference? Blaney, what is the difference? All right, everyone. What is the difference between, um, a yam and a sweet potato? Do you know? If you don't know, then you need the book. What's the difference? Recreational culinary reference for the curious and confused. Uh, this is a really sweet book. Um, let's see, Lena, do you have it up? Great illustrations too. Uh, I presented this at, um, Anna, I think it was the library journal webinar. Um, I just think that this is really cool. It's got illustrations throughout and it is whimsical, but also extremely practical. It's for people who are, who know, who are food nerds and people like me who love food, but don't really know a lot about how to make it all work. Um, and there are, there are, there's confusion over terms and techniques and dishes and and this all gets sort of parsed out without making you feel like a big dum dum for not knowing these things what's the difference between broccoli and broccoli rob i know the broccoli rob is a little um not satisfying to me it's just a little too bitter but whatevs um crumblers cobblers crisps do you know the difference if you don't you need this book what's the difference uh, the author, Brett Washaw, is an editor at Apple News and uh, knows that she was the COO of Lucky Peach. Uh, she has a newsletter of this uh, called What's the Difference? Um, and um, I don't know, bacon versus pancetta, speck versus pork belly. Really? Do you really know? Nah, you got to get this book. Um, so anyway, it's got tons of illustrations and it's just, it's smart and accessible and I, I don't know, I just think it's super fun. You need it. Thoughts, questions? I don't know. All good? Who's next? Casey, Casey Davis says it made right. Broccoli Rob is awesome. I should know my son is a chef and makes a mean dish. Well, Casey Davis, you are more than welcome to send in your recipe and we will put it on the Library Love Fest blog post and I'll even make it. 
and maybe you'll convert me. All right. What do you think? <laughs> Jams versus jellies versus preserves. Go. What's the difference? I don't know. You need, you need this book. I could do this all day. <laughs> um, um, I, one question from Casey was podcast for confident women. And yes, she does post several podcasts and I'll put a link to that on her website. Why women kill criminal broads. So good call. She has, she has podcasts. Tori Telfer does. And I guess I answer the one about coming on Instagram, but let me know yeah. if you have more questions. Beautiful. All right. Next. Okay, I'll talk about my remarkable journey. Can you pull that up, Lainey? Is your remarkable journey how you ended up at HarperCollins in the library marketing department? You mean that remarkable that journey? Is, that is, that's the second most remarkable journey we can talk about today. Though I have to give the edge to the late, great Katherine Johnson. All right. uh, I, I think so. So we're midway through Black History Month. And I think while this is publishing, publishing in May, I think uh, the eGalley is available. So I think this is a great way to celebrate this month. So Katherine Johnson, she was a central figure of uh, Margot Lee Shetterly's Hidden Figures, which has sold nearly a million copies now. Um, she passed away last year at the age of 101, and what a life Katherine Johnson led. Um, this is her story. She wrote this along with uh, Joylet Heilick and Katherine Moore. So this is her memoir. This starts from the beginning her growing up in the Allegheny Mountains in West Virginia. She was a prodigy, surprising no one now that we know what we know, but she was a prodigy then. And she worked her way through um, with the help of really encouraging parental advice um, with some very key kind of notions and rules that no one is better than you, education is paramount and asking questions can break barriers. So this book follows her through that uh, through her life and the influence of historically black colleges and university, universities and how important those are then and now to, you know, open up the possibilities for those who might not have it otherwise. Uh, and then also her journey into NASA. Um, again, she was one of these central figures uh, of the story. Her contributions are numerous and just she is just a fascinating person and a life worth celebrating. And that's what this book is doing. Um, she helped land the first, I guess I should mention her main contribution, which is helping land the first man on the moon. She was one of the human computers, as they called them, who did so much math just in her head. Just my mind doesn't work that way. So it, it, it kind of, it boggles my mind how that's even possible. But again, she's an incredible woman and her contributions are just, innumerable. So I, I highly recommend this memoir. It's going on sale May 25th, but the eGalley is available now. Definitely worth a read. Thanks. Lainey? Oh, is it my turn? Let's I don't see. Know. I don't know. Is it? Um, I will happily go. Okay. Um, one thing about us not having these in order is it takes me a second to get to, so I am sorry. That's all right. Okay. Wreckage of My Presence by Casey Wilson. So you might know Casey Wilson. Um, she's an actress, writer, director, but um, she also has a podcast called Bitch Sesh. Um, she's had it since 2015. She does it with um, her friend, Danielle Schneider. And um, I love this review of the podcast. It says... Uh, where did it go? The LA Review of Books said a thoughtful discussion of cultural garbage, which occupies a sweet and spot between an HBO comedy special and a Sunday brunch. <laughs> so she has this podcast, and um, and we we know her all around. Uh, you know, she's in the in TV and movies um, as well, and I'm sure by that picture you recognize her. Um, and she's just so funny. And I'm talking to the editor about this book. She's just so jazzed about this book. I think everything she, she, she loves writing and loves telling her story. And she, she's just so excited to get the word out for this book. And uh, it's, you know, insightful. It's got essays um, talking about her life as a comedian um, and going into the podcast as well as being an actress. And there's really 
I mean, it's really sweet and funny, surprising, surprisingly funny and sweet stories that are throughout this. Um, and there's a great quotes that have been coming in for this. Um, Andy Cohen has said something about it, Amy Sadara. So Amy said, we'll destroy you. Laughter through the tears. Love Casey Wilson. Andy Cohen said, I had the thrilling experience of laughing out loud throughout reading the wreckage of my presence. Casey is as hilarious on the page as she is in person and her stories are often more bizarre than anything I've seen on the housewives with tons of heart. And so, like I said, great, great quotes coming for this one. Phoebe Robinson, um, who wrote, can't, you can't touch my hair. She has a big podcast as well. Um, so all of these people are loving this book. And I think, I don't know where we saw that, but we had a video that Casey had sent to, I guess, the sales force. She was like, I'll do anything to talk about books. I mean, anything. Like, she's very funny. Um, and she, she's, she's here, to be honest, and, and tell it through her, her words. There's a lot of great media lineup, too. So you'll definitely see this book coming out. Okay. Lainey? I'm going to talk about the day the world stops shopping. Can you pull up the jacket? Yes. Okay. While you do that, because I can't believe it's already 2.47, I'm going to start. So here we go. This is a book on consumerism. Consuming less is our best strategy for saving the planet. But can we do it? This is... Uh, thoughtful and surprisingly optimistic look at how we might achieve a world without shopping. I know, seems, seems like a, a strange big conceit here. We can't stop shopping and yet we must. This is the consumer dilemma. Um, this is a, a thought experiment about the tension between consumerism and climate change and it gets, how it gets played out in the real world um, as COVID-19 uh, strikes us uh, in 2020. Um, so I want to read something to you from the editor, and I was hoping I would get this in, and I just did. Um, okay, so this is the book to read if you're concerned about the state of our world, and if you're looking for a bit of hope as to what the way forward could be. So the book basically says, if we could just dial back our consumption to what it was in the 1980s, our planet would start to heal immediately. Um, the author goes on this really fun tour around the world, visiting Ecuador, where they consume at exactly the right level. Centuries old businesses in Japan, hunter gatherer societies in Nambia. The author goes around to see what they look like for our society and how we can learn from them. He basically finds out that we could not only save the planet, but be happier and more connected people if we made this change. It's a perfect combination of fun and hopeful storytelling life-changing insights about the way we live and incredible research and reporting on the state of the world. Now, I have to tell you that quotes have been coming in day after day. Andrew Blum, who wrote Tubes and the Weather Machine, if you haven't read those books, you totally have to read those books. Um, Andrew Blum, I don't know if I said Andrew Blum, Andrew Blum, The Weather Machine and Tubes, two separate books, really fascinating, breaks down how Weather works. Uh, he's just he he is brilliant. He came into the office once and he blew my mind. Anyway, he writes: the day the world st stops shopping is a delight. McKinnon has given us a powerful exploration of a riddle central to our days and lives: how we are, what we buy, and how buying less might make us so much more. Um, there are quotes here from I, I could go on and on. There are so many of them. Um, this is um, Alyssa Court, who wrote Squeeze, which is another very cool book about why our families can't afford um, America. She says, J.B. McKinnon's The Day the World Stops Shopping is a welcome and rare mix, a strong environmental argument and a jaunty picaresque. For the former, McKinnon makes a convincing case that we need to shop less now. Green consumerism isn't just about buying ecologically sound stuff, or recycling our rubbish. It's about buying many fewer things, leaving us so much less to recycle in the first place. You will want to buy this book and after you read it, little else. Boom. Interesting, right? 
I know. Lots to think about in that book. How are we doing? Doing well. Okay. I have another book to talk about. American Portrait, which is a drop in title for summer, June 15th. This is really cool. So if any of you are familiar with the American Project, this began at the beginning of 2020 by PBS, and it was this kind of multi-platform project to document the lives of Americans and all the diversity and plethora of experiences as possible. So what they did was reach out to Americans from every walk of life and ask them to kind of document their lives um, with a series of answers to cues. So they had, I'm just gonna read some of these, like my American story started when, I don't know what it's like, or you don't know what it's like to, my greatest challenge is, the tradition I carry on is, and so on and so forth. So people from all over the country submitted photos, um, written word, you know, documenting and answering these questions. So this book now is taking some of the best, um, you know, photography and elements of that to compile and then tell the story of the year 2020. And what's really fascinating is, again, this project began to uh, celebrate the 50th anniversary of uh, PBS. And then by the time this all came about, obviously we ran into COVID and then it completely kind of, I think was the book and the project that people needed. I think just had that connection. Uh, there were 14,000 posts total that PBS compiled and shared. It's also a running a uh, program that you can watch online. Uh, I think most or all of those episodes are available now. I'll post the link in the chat. Um, but yeah, the images in this book that have been compiled are so striking. Um, there's going to be a library hardcover edition of this as well. It's a trade paperback original. Um, so it's not a single author. There's not necessarily commentary. It's just the, the images and the people do all the talking in this book and it speaks volumes. It's really something special and we're really excited about it. Um, so yeah, this is publishing June 15th. Um, really, really cool. So we're excited about it. It's American Portrait, the story of us told by us. I'm sorry, I didn't have the cover. I didn't realize it wasn't on listed, but I don't didn't have time to just type in away. But that's the PBS, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. That's so good. I've watched a bunch of those, and they are just tear your heart out. I mean, it's just really a slice of Americana. It's all of us. It's really, really wonderful. Um, we are close to running out of time. I have one more book that I want to talk about before we end. Should I go? Or Lainey, do you want to go and then I'll go? Or what do you want to do? Go ahead. Okay. Um, I don't, I'm don't. i not sure if we've talked about this book yet, but this is a book that's coming out in May and it's called Down East. Five Main Girls and the Unseen Story of Rural America by Gigi George, 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 or George S. Again, apologies. I do not know if I'm saying it correctly. Um, so this is, um, this is kind of like Hillbilly Elegy, Heartland territory. Uh, this author um, has, um, not only does she know this, this area well, she's also spent more than 25 years in politics working uh, um, for the uh, Hillary Clinton in the White House and in the uh, New York City Education Department. So she's been an advisor for many political campaigns. She knows her stuff. Um, and this is, um, this, is a, this is about, um, you know, this is, this is not, uh, this, this is about five young girls um, and um, what it's like to be growing up in rural America in Maine, um, Northeastern Maine. It's like 70 miles, let me check this. Yeah, it's in uh, Washington County. It's an hour's drive from the heart of famed and bustling Acadia National Park. So this is out there. Um, and um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of the haves and then there's a lot of the have nots um, in every place, but Maine is really, you know, it can be 
quite tough there. Um, so this is what it's like for these five girls. So they're teens um, and um, one has uh, an abusive um, drug addicted father. The other is a writer who um, is uh, feeling stifled by her church and her town. The other one is a softball pitching phenom whose passion is the lobster fishing that she learned from her father. Uh, then there's Audrey, who is a high school basketball star, and she's questioning her choice of uh, where to go for college. And then Josie, the school uh, valedictorian who's bound for Yale. So they you know this is about the good and the bad. This is, you know, the shrinking populations, vanishing opportunities, widespread opioid addiction. Bad part. The good part are the values of family and nature and the dignity of work. It's beautiful beautiful part of the country. Um, and so um, this is um, this is the story. This is focusing on um, America's most sparsely populated areas. And uh, what's different about this book, which I think is different and um, makes it very unique, is that um, not many journalists or academics have separated out girls and women as central subjects and essential contributors to the rural American narrative. This is just based on these five teenage girls um, and through their lens. So this is a, so those are, you know, all incomplete pictures. Um, and so that's what makes this book different. The author addresses this gap and then she turns a, um, a clear eye to, the, to these five uh, women whose lives are shaped by their town and uh, who in turn are, stepping up to reshape um, you know, their birthplaces in new ways. So this is giving voice to these girls, portrayed in its pages and to millions of girls across rural America. So again, think, think um, you know, hillbilly elegy, but through the eyes of these five young girls and how their lives are, um, you know, the good, the good and the bad. And it's, uh, you know, I, it really does shine a light on Maine and everybody thinks about the you know, the, 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 the lobster rolls and all of that stuff, but there's a whole, you know, there's a whole other thing going on there. And so um, this is called Down East, Five Main Girls and the Unseen Story of Rural America. And that is coming out uh, May 25th, very important book and a beautiful cover. I don't know if you were able to show the cover, Lainey, but it's really beautiful. And I think that's my last book. Um. Just quickly, um, yeah. I don't have a cover, but D.L. Hughley, um, we have a new book from him. Uh, and I think it's perfect for, and so are his last two books, How Not to Get Shot and Surrender White People, which were amazing. This one's called How to Survive America, and it's coming out in June, and it's Black History Month. So it's a great time to dive into these books and kind of start a conversation. Um, and this book, how to Survive America coming out in June is all about how um, racism has unjustly predis predisposed black people and minorities to health and safety risk and how they are disproportionately, <laughs> disproportionately um, infected and they're not getting the care they need. Side note, there's a great podcast about that in the Mississippi Delta from In the Dark. So check that out. Um, but this book, really dives into that and how how to how to have a conversation around that so just wanted to let you know yeah that's cool um can we show the um art history coloring book really fast yeah because so you know we did promise it i just minimized eight of my so one second hilarious wait chris or is there anything else that you wanted to mention before we say so long, farewell. Mm -hmm. I'm loving no. the comments. Uh, next week's door to door, maybe? Chris, take it away. Yeah, so on Tuesday, uh, that's our regularly scheduled time. We'll be back with a new episode. Uh, featuring two acclaimed graphic novelists, artists, writers, Tim Fielder and Johnny Sun. So Tim Fielder uh, is the author of Infinitum, an Afrofuturist tale. 
Um, and then Johnny's son, you'll know from Everyone's an Alien when you're an alien too. And then his upcoming essay collection, Goodbye Again, which is already getting a ton of raves. Um, so yeah, we're really excited. I think this is something new and different and much needed for door to door. So uh, we're really excited to host both of these fantastic authors and You should artists, listen to you know? the audio e-galley of Goodbye Again. Had a tear, shed a tear. It was really beautiful. Yeah, he really there. has a special way of kind of getting down into the essence of what it is to be human. And it's just, yeah, it's very tender and real and uh, very excited, so. Uh, yeah, so we hope you join us. And uh, here's the cover of the art history coloring book. Cause you know, it's good to color. And um, this is uh, this is great. 150 black and white um, line illustrations to color as well as information on each work and full color photos. Um, these books are really popular. You know, we did the human brain. That's one of the, you know, backlist uh, books with this coloring concepts. That thing sold like 300,000 copies. It's, it's a coloring, biology coloring book. It sold 260,000 copies. These books just sell and sell and they're super fun and educational. Um, and, um, you know, Michelangelo, Monet, Picasso, join them. Color, why not? It comes with a table of contents, index, glossary, and references, and a full color photo insert. So I am sort of joking. It is a really beautiful um, book and you can learn a lot while you have some fun. And God knows we could all use a little fun. And I think that's it. Well, are there any other, any questions we haven't answered? Is everybody good? Is everybody, thank you all so much for coming on. Um, Joe Carroll, thank you. Great gift to encourage learning and art at the same time. Absolutely, Amy. Um, same thing with what's the difference? Broccoli, broccolini. I'm waiting, Casey Davis. I'm waiting for the recipe. Broccoli to Rob. Um, <laughs> Yes, thank you all. Thank you. Um, I don't know. I think we've gotten to everybody. Maxine, Haya. I don't know. We're all glad you're here. And if there's anything we haven't answered or you've got some thoughts, Barbara now says, Barbara Jenko, now I know what to buy my baby sister for her 60th birthday. She is an artist and loves coloring as mindfulness. Well, thank you. That's so fun. <gasps> Jennifer Winberry, big dating game kiss. You know it's coming. You know it's coming. Come on. I think we got to kiss them all goodbye. We have to. HR is not looking. So we'll see you on Tuesday. That's going to be super fun. That is going to be super crazy, high energy fun. I can't wait. Um, until then, stay warm wherever you are. Texas, we're thinking of you. Hang in there. Wish, uh, Wish you all well. Um, stay safe. Chris, Laney, dating game, kiss goodbye. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Bye, everyone. <laughs>